Oh, that was that same today? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I, it? Re I replied to her yesterday. I thought, oh. Isn't that a different last name? Huh? Which was the name of Rob? Was it Mello? Oh, yeah. Is that the same person? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I, I, I wrote back to her, I guess. Either way. I'm 90% sure. All right, ready? Should I ask? Yeah. Good. Good evening, everyone. Despite our best efforts with blocking off a driveway and bringing rain, you still found your way in tonight. So I guess thank you for that, but um, we'll try harder next time. So um, I wanna call this meeting of the Amherst School Board to order in uh, what I hope will be an orderly meeting tonight uh, and what will be a productive meeting tonight as we vote on our reopening plan. We started this process technically months ago, but the boards had our first crack at it, looking at the information a couple of weeks ago, and then certainly Thursday night, as many of you have probably seen and heard about on Facebook, if you weren't in attendance that night, um, a sometimes contentious uh, forum, if you will, during the meeting on Thursday night for the overall SAU. So just to recap, the SAU voted to approve that on the whole to send it down to the local boards. And now tonight is our shot to discuss this further if this plan meets what we wanna have set up for the Amherst School District, in particular, Clark Wilkins, and then AMS. So we have the ability to change this if we need to, if that's the way this board votes. Um, we have the ability to uh, keep it the way that it is and go along with Mont Vernon and Sauhegan. Uh, both of those boards will get a chance to vote on it in their next public meetings, although they did vote in support of it with their members that were in attendance on Thursday night. So those are the details as to why we're having this tonight. It is not solely an opportunity for all of us to get together and, and have some fun like we did on Thursday night for another five hours, but it is uh, the official adoption of this plan and to give Superintendent Steele and the administration the authority to go forward and enact either the plan that is on the record or the plan uh, that we vote on here tonight, whatever modifications may come about. So. Before we get into uh, public input, we will have a public input like we had on Thursday night. We'll start it off for the first 30 minutes. We'll have everybody uh, given three minutes to speak their mind. We'll give you a warning at the two and a half minute mark to give you 30 seconds to wrap up your remarks. And we're hope that you're, we hope that you're able to do that and be respectful of the time allotted to other folks as they would hopefully allot the same time to you. If you are for the plan, as I will describe briefly in just a minute, you will stand on my right, the microphone that I'm facing directly. If you are against this plan, you can use the microphone that is on my left, which is your right in the audience. So when the time comes, please line up there in an orderly fashion. No touching, like we tell kids in elementary school, keep your hands to yourself, and then we'll get to everybody for their three-minute comment. And again, with a two-and-a-half-minute warning uh, to let you know that your time is coming to an end. I will stress um, and, and not to sound too parentish, because even my kids don't listen to me when I do this, but I, I do want to stress that we have had multiple reports and, and multiple people reach out to us with concerns about the overall tenor of the meeting on Thursday night. This is, as we've seen in the last 18 months, as passionate a topic as we can have about coronavirus. And when you involve somebody's kids, the mamas and the papa bears and all of us become even more uh, dandered up and, and we get more excited and, and red faced about this. I will ask tonight for order uh, in this meeting. We, we don't wanna have cat calls, cheering and jeering, doesn't do us any good. Uh, respectful debate and conversation is what we're here. That's what the public comment is for. Uh, and I'm hopeful that everybody will stick to that tonight so that we can get through this and, and hear everybody's comments in an orderly fashion. I ask that you please do not interrupt somebody else when they're speaking. You will have your shot. And after you're done, if you need to come back up after everybody's gone through that wants to speak a first time, we will gladly hear from you again. That is what we're here for tonight. And as I mentioned, I, I jokingly said five hours the other night. If that's what it takes for us to hear from everybody tonight, we can do that. Um, I say that as I ramble on. So we'll have three minutes of public comment at, for the first half an hour. When we get to the end of that half hour, we'll go down to two minutes. Uh, and then we'll judge where we are there in terms of everybody getting a chance to speak. And if we start to get cyclical with repeat comments from people going through on public comments, somebody coming up three or four times, uh, and just two people going back and forth, we'll end public comment, and then the board will have a chance to have our discussion up here. Please remember that as a board, uh, it is policy recommended by the School Board Association and certainly policy that we adhere to as well not to engage in any sort of debate with people during the public comment. There is a time and a place for that. 
in other meetings. This is still a, uh, a discussion and a meeting of the board, one of two that we'll have this week. So you can ask us questions. We can take it under advisement and try to answer it at a future meeting, but we won't be answering any comments directly as we go through here tonight. So that said, I wanna share two things. We will be voting on the reopening plan here tonight. It was modified from the original plan that was shared out last Thursday. And I assume that if you're here, um, you have seen the changes and you are aware of what this plan consists of. So August 31st, we will operate in a tiered color-coded system uh, and each level of that system has a variety of metrics that will be used to determine which color that we are going to open in. During the meeting on Thursday as a SAU board, we voted to send to the boards. We raised the thresholds of some of these school cases from a smaller percentage to a larger percentage, meaning that one or two cases in the school will not alter a color change. It'll take 10, 12, 15 cases, depending on the size of the school before we change colors and the level of risk mitigation increases or decreases as a result. We've also changed the metrics for the active number of cases per 100,000. That is the metric that we'll use as one of those, uh, one of those metrics. That's the measurement we'll use as opposed to just a small number of cases. And this was brought up by Mont Vernon because they have such a small town. Two cases would have put them into an orange status or maybe the yellow status. And two cases out of you know a couple hundred kids is not a very large sample of population. So we all agreed that we would change that. The big issue that we will have um, is the situation in yellow. That was where our most heated debate was the other night. And that is a mask mandate as it stands right now. Um, depending on the color code, we only have a mask mandate at one level. The yellow level was modified from a mandated mask if we were in yellow to a man an optional mask in the yellow category. So with the increased parameters and then the mask optional, there is a larger window for kids to choose to wear masks or more appropriately for parents to choose to send their kids to school in a masked, uh, in a masked environment. So that is the point that will certainly be uh, of, it was of conversation the other night. It was the most heated part of this. And, and as we've seen, it's been the most heated part of the media um, overall as well. The other amendment that we did approve on Thursday night um, maybe took a while for us to, all of us to understand it, but um, as part of our operating system, we will have a remote option for students. It is not remote like it was last year. It'll be a remote program in partnership with the VLACs, the virtual learning charter academy that's based over in Exeter, I believe it is. We will be working with them and we will have a federally funded interventionist that is able to work with all kids who choose or all parents who choose to have their kids undergo this school year for all or part of that time with the VLAX program. They can do the remote, but they're just not going to have actual remote teachers from inside of our buildings like we had last year. Um, it's not possible. We want to have five days of, of in-person learning for everybody. And to do that, we need all hands on deck for all of the teachers that are in this building on a full-time basis. So we voted to approve that for all students, not just students who had medical needs or IEP needs. So that could potentially, depending on however we vote tonight and, and depending on what parents choose, lead to a larger pool of kids that choose the VLAX option. So if one interventionist is not enough, we will investigate that further and potentially use additional federal funds to um, provide a second interventionist. All of those details will be up to the administration, but that is where the plan stands as of right now. The last thing that I will mention is we did send out a survey after the meeting on Thursday night. We let it run through the weekend, and it was just to Amherst parents because we know that our board was divided on this topic, uh, and certainly the opinions of folks in the meeting on Thursday night were as well. We asked us two simple questions. Given the local current conditions, do you think Clark Wilkins and AMS students should be required to wear a mask indoors at any point. And there were 57% of uh, people said yes, with about uh, just over 1,000 people voting in that category. So based on current conditions, yes, they wanted a mask mandate, 57%. The other question we asked was, do you support a temporary mask mandate in the future if the conditions warrant it? And 82% of parents said that. So that would be, as it stands right now, the orange status. 82% uh, of our parents said that they would support a mask mandate in the orange status, uh, if not the yellow status as well, which currently does not have a mandate. So though we sent out that survey, and uh, again, we had over a 1,000 votes uh, to both questions, 57% for one and then 82% um, for the other one. So with that, uh, I will open it up for public comment. As we said, three minutes for everybody for the first half hour. And then as needed, we will continue on and, and cut it down to two minutes at that point. So if you do have a comment that you would like to share or multiple comments, please come to the microphones. 
four is on my right, against is on uh, your right, my left, uh, and we will start as soon as someone is brave enough to come to the mic first tonight. When you do come up, it is state law. You do not need to give us your address, but it is law that you give us first and last name and your town of residence. Yes, if you are against the policy as it stands, actually, uh, that's a good question, because it's if basically, if you want a mask mandate, stand over in this side. If you do not want a mask mandate, stand over on that side. I realized we had, I, I didn't have it backwards, but it's different than the arrangement we had the other night. So if you want a mask mandate, stand over behind this gentleman uh, that is in front of the four microphone. If you are against a mask mandate, you can stand on the other side. And so with that, I will start off with the gentleman in the four line, your name and your town of residence. We do not need a specific address uh, and we will get started tonight. Uh, my name is Reed Cunningham and I'm a uh, resident of Amherst. Um, we recently moved to Amherst and our son will be starting at the Amherst Middle School next week. My wife, Jenny, and I have been very concerned by the speakers at earlier meetings that children are not at risk of COVID. From personal experience, we can say this isn't true. Spring of 2020, our son was diagnosed with the pediatric inflammatory syndrome, a kid who had no underlying health issues, who swam four or five times a week with his team, spent six days at our children's hospital being treated by a team of doctors. We then had six months of follow-up, including having to regularly visit with an immunologist and a pediatric cardiologist. The news is filled with stories of states along the Gulf Coast having run out of their ICU beds, including their pediatric ICU beds. Florida today admitted that 25% of their positive tests are for people under the age of 19. And of that group, the test positive rate is 25%. So they're missing large numbers of people who are getting this and passing it on as our children. The latest recommendation from the CDC dated August 5th has two points that I wanna to touch on. One is students benefit from in-person learning and safely returning to in-person instruction in the fall in 2021 is a priority. And two, due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, CDC recommends universal indoor masking for all students age two and older, staff, teachers, and visitors to K-12 schools. The American Academy of Pediatrics on Friday came out with very similar recommendations. My wife and I wish to urge the board to follow these recommendations from these centers of excellence in our community and our country. Our son struggled with remote learning and we would very much like to be able to keep the schools open so that he can go in person. We think by having masks and following these recommendations, this is the best opportunity for the schools to be open and for all our children to learn and yet to be safe. We live in a broader community and these children are going out and they're living or being with their parents, their grandparents and other people who may be immune compromised and that we don't wish to see this spread. On a final, on a personal note, we wish, don't, we wish to not see other parents go through what we went through. Nobody, we consider ourselves incredibly lucky. We have 30 seconds, Mr. Cunningham. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we consider ourselves incredibly lucky that six months later, there were no long-term effects for our son other than the hospital bills, which we continue to pay. As a father, I would say that nobody wants to have to see their child on FaceTime or listen to a team of doctors treating their child over a conference call because you can't go to the hospital. We thank the board for this time and we hope that you'll follow the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll go to the gentleman on the left now. Hi, my name is Mike Corrigan. Um, but first, I'd say uh, to Reed, I'm really sorry that happened to your son. That sounds like a very difficult experience. Thank you for sharing that. So my name is Mike Corrigan. I'm from Amherst. Um, Mike, could I have you move a little closer to the mic? Some of us up here are a little deaf, and the rain is loud, and yeah, can't hear you. Yeah, so sure, let me move the mic up maybe Thank a little you. higher. Okay, so. You know, in the line of thinking that Reed shared, I think folks can, we, and these are some prepared marks, we can, uh, you can be for the use of masks without making them mandatory in certain situations. You can also be against masking without banning them in other situations. Um, Tom, you did a, a nice job of really explaining where we are. So I'm just gonna go right into what we know in terms of clinical data. Some of us, many of us as part of our work or just in our own research spent a lot of time on this and gold standard randomized controlled trials in large patient populations of 
thousands of patients. Masks didn't show statistically significant benefit in preventing the spread of COVID. However, in those trials, as part of fair balance, specific patient subgroups in these large trials weren't specifically studied. Now, conversely, in smaller observational trials that were not randomized or controlled or even had control groups, some reported benefits to masking have been seen. And this may be a source of some confusion amongst the community now is that we see conflicting data. Uh, there are also benefits tied to preventing the spread of COVID via comprehensive hand hygiene and social distancing protocols. Data also suggests benefit from diet supplementation with foods high in D3 and zinc to boost immune function. At best, the case in support of masking is murky and shouldn't, it can't be the only significant tactic to have in place as part of a COVID mitigation strategy. That's really my issue here. Additionally, there are downsides to masking that were very well addressed during last week's board meeting. Finally, the CDC's own mortality data in children under the age of 18 with the flu during the eight months, 30 seconds, sir. 2018 19 flu season was higher than the rate of mortality seen during the 18 months during the COVID pandemic. We have three recommendations make masks optional at yellow level, but supplement yellow with comprehensive hygiene and distancing protocols. At the board's discretion, adjust orange to be able to pivot quickly if COVID rates are going up. And finally, engage student populations with educational initiatives tied to nutrition and hygiene. We need to engage students and parents with science-backed COVID mitigation process that they can control as well as have them dealing with any potential mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Gurgeon. Hi guys, I miss you. Sorry, I'm not up there. Surprise. You do have to introduce you. I'm sorry, I introduced you, but sorry. you still have to do it. My name is Ellen Brugin, and I'm from Amherst. I'm standing at the four mic because I am for the children, as you guys all know, as I'm sure everybody in here is. I'm not for and against masks. I'm not even going to really touch upon that tonight. What I want to talk about is what I think is missing from a plan um, again this year. So I'm not here to debate masks. I am here to discuss the hurdle of children having to wear masks for six hours a day with only a 30 minute break to eat and a 30 minute break to play outside. Seven hours total, they're at school and then they're on buses. Kids could be in masks for eight hours. I've been listening to your meetings and at the SAU meeting and was discouraged that once again, SAU 39 has not put together a multifaceted outdoor plan for both learning and additional breaks. I do know that some teachers took their classes out last year. I do know that we rallied at the 11th hour to collect tents and shade. I do know that many middle schoolers enjoyed walks while they ate snack because one of them told me that. Um, but I also know that due to the lack of policy and accountability, not all staff made the effort to be sure this was a part of teaching each day. I do know the outdoors was not prioritized last year, and we seem once again to be lacking a strong plan. As a local private preschool owner, the state required SAU 39 to share with me how they were going to be using their ESSR funds. And for anybody who doesn't know what those are, essentially the COVID funds to stabilize the delivery of education in Amherst. I was able to look over the plan and what was included were laptops, um, an instructor to help with the children who were taking VLACs and additional assessments to make sure the children were not falling behind. These are all important things, especially the laptops. Um, some were already in place, including teachers, classroom teachers who know and understand the children that benchmarks and any holes of learning that may be present. I do wonder if they were invited to have any input on how the ESR funds were to be used. 30 seconds. Thank you. Nobody will be surprised what I saw missing. 
Perhaps in lieu of a teacher assessing VLAC students, we could hire district-wide outdoor educator who could provide our classroom educators with a guide to outdoor learning, the necessary items needed, a creative way to use them at Clark, Wilkins, and the middle school. This person could rally the community for gear donations, coordinate volunteers because everybody will be outside so we can use volunteers. The outcomes are endless on how this could benefit our district for years to come. The beauty of this person's role would be endless, as I said. There's been a lot of talk about the science at these meetings. Can I have like 30 more seconds, Tom? You can finish, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about science. We've talked a lot about masking. We've talked a lot about unmasking. We've talked a lot about how high schoolers need to sleep later. And here we are all starting different change, um, time changes. The science of getting kids outdoor is not being discussed at all, again. So I'll give you only 100 reasons. The increased physical health and levels of vitamin D, which I'm sure would be included in your nutritional plan, builds and strength through cognitive and social emotional development. Children who spend long periods of time out learning, outdoors learning, have the ability to move, talk louder, breathe fresh air instead of recycle air, and be more alert. When a human is more alert, they become calmer, less frustrated, and better learners. Ms. Scrooge, can you share the rest of that list with us? We don't have a time for yes, 100 items on it. I will finish. In closing, the- I would like to invite anybody here who's interested in being a part of a group to support our SAU 39 and getting these kids outdoors for two hours a day, 45 minutes for recess as well, and early childhood, pre-K and kindergarten, one forest day a week, two hours outside. Thank you, Anybody Ellen. Anybody who wants to sign up, please see me. And I, and I will say that I, I didn't mention it earlier. If you have a written statement, if you'd like to share that with Danae down here in the front corner, she will put that into the record. So we have that as part of the minutes. Uh, if you have a digital copy, you'd like to email her, that'll probably save her some typing time. Um, so that should be much appreciated. And it, it is not lost on me, Ellen, the irony of discussing outdoor playtime as a hurricane takes place above us. So <laughs> uh, let's go to the uh, again slide with Mr. Kakmar. Tim Kakmar, Mack Hill Road. Um, last Thursday, residents of Amherst and Mount Vernon expressed their concerns regarding children wearing masks to start the school year. These concerned parents included a PhD neuroscientist speaking of the developmental issues mask wearing causes to children and the unknown long-term impact, a PhD material scientist who spoke about the flow of particles through fabric. You heard from several people working in the pharmaceutical industry about the accuracy of PCR tests, the vaccine, and side effects. A parent took Mr. Steele's reopening questionnaire results and pointed out uh, incorrect results and a little bit of bias in the questions. Overall, you heard from 20 informed parents or just concerned citizens of the towns. They presented facts from CDC data, journal articles, and the parents basically requested to make masks optional, to let the medical decisions be made for their own children by themselves. The SAU 39 board and superintendent had a physician speak on their behalf, supporting masks in schools. There was unfortunately no counter argument from a board invitee invitee presenting a counter argument. Uh, And frankly, I think that kicked off a very emotional and somewhat adversarial meeting. In support of wearing masks, the following points were made. CDC recommends masks indoors for vaccinated and unvaccinated people at all times. Using CDC information can be very confusing as they continually contradict themselves in their message. Looking at their science brief transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in K-12 schools updated July 9th, 2021, they present a significant amount of data, how there is minimal spread in schools from student to student, even student to teacher, and even that students are not a primary source of exposure to children in the school. In the several studies cited, there was no mask policies in place, and yet they go into a litany later on in the conclusions of how masks are required and can save everybody. Let me get this straight. Kids don't spread COVID in schools, but kids do spread COVID in schools and should wear masks. Those two statements cannot be true at the same time. All right there in the same web page. That's not science. Our scientists and medical professionals are failing us. The second point was that it's only recommendation left in the toolbox for them to use. Masks are not the only mitigation methods left for you to consider. How about basic temperature checks at the beginning of the day? That is a sure sign of a cold, a fever. I think you can use some of that grant money to buy some really high tech thermometers for the teachers. 30 seconds. Masks are restrictive mitigation. Um, 
And then there were fearful people concerned about their kids. There were news reports from Texas and Florida. Um, overall, there was an interesting interpretation of the Declaration of Independence. And however, no statistics or data were presented on the effectiveness of masks. No data-driven rationale was provided to support little children wearing masks for eight hours or more. I'll get back up and finish. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll go to the four line now. Hi, good evening. Um, and thank you guys for everything. I've watched a lot of your meetings over the last almost two years and you guys have, have a really hard job and I appreciate everything that you guys have done. Can we have um, you introduce yourself I'm as sorry, well? my name is Jennifer. I live on Sawmill Lane in Amherst. Thank you. Um, I spent most of my adult life working in a hospital. Uh, I am a clinical laboratory scientist by trade and can probably speak to PCR tests more than most people. PCR tests have come a long way in the last 20 months or so in detection of COVID. Not only that, but there are, PCR is a type of testing methodology. It describes multiple different types of platforms of testing. I don't wanna get into testing. I do testing every day and I really don't wanna concentrate on that. In order to prevent COVID, we have multiple things at our disposal. Distancing, disinfection, hand washing, testing, surveillance, contract tracing, and masks. There is limited data about masks. We are more than likely gonna find out a lot more in the next couple of years, either for or against whether or not masks are actually effective. I believe that there is at least some protection for children wearing masks. And masks work best when everybody wears them. It's, you know, you can talk a lot about personal choice. My daughter knows more about viruses now than I had ever hoped that she would know at her age. But we tell her the truth. We're honest with her. We teach her. We're using all of this as teachable moments. And she just wants to go back to school. And if wearing a mask helps keep her safe, her friends safe, and everyone around her safe, even if in three or five years I find out I'm completely wrong, I'm going to be okay with that because I did what I could at the time to keep them safe. I think we're going to find out a lot in the coming years of how it's, everything's transmitted, different prevention methods. You guys can't socially distance in the classroom. You guys have a ton of germ factories from everything from strep throat to COVID to flu. I don't think asking a child to wear a mask without making sure there's mask breaks and outdoor recess and stuff is totally appropriate, but asking them to wear a mask is not an imposition. I'm sorry, I worked in a hospital. We wear masks, we wear PPE. It's part of our jobs. You can get masks that are comfortable for kids. You have to work with them, size them, and make them custom to the child. So that's all I have to say. So have a great night. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Lee Kakmar, 15 Mac Hill. I'm standing at the against, which is very negative. I'm not against anything. I'm not against masks. I'm not against children. <laughs> Ellen, I want to point out wherever you are, I totally love the idea of getting kids outdoors. I think that's vital. And um, she's right on point there. Um, to the last speaker, I dispute the PCR. The actual inventor of the PCR said it should have never been used as a diagnostic tool. So um, I'd like to cite, there was a large scale study of COVID transmission in American schools. This is an article I've sent to you all, and I hope you've had a chance to read it because it's actually a really good article. I think what happens is things get published and a summary gets put out and then data that was also found in the study makes it nowhere. So the study is looking like, oh, that's the only conclusion. But the, um, one of the large scale studies of COVID transmission in American schools, um, I also found, it, this was not reported, but they found equally important that um, they the, the findings cast doubt on the impact of many of the most common mitigation measures in American schools, distance, hybrid models, classroom barriers, HEPA filters, and most notably requiring students masking were each found to have not a statistically significant benefit. In other words, those measures could not be said to be effective. That's in an actual large scale COVID transmission study in American schools. 
again, it wasn't reported, so it's probably foreign. But I think it's really good news. <laughs> and, and the reason they couldn't decide is they didn't layer the analysis of the mediation techniques. They didn't do masks versus ventilation versus outside time. They literally just looked at kids, no control group, and said, you should mask them, <laughs> um, which is important. That's, that's things that people don't know and they don't really hear. Um, so mask wearing among, this is a quote from the, Massachusetts, the president of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. He said, mask wearing among children is generally considered a low risk mitigation strategy as the last person just testified. It's not harmful, so why don't you just do it, right? Um, however, the negatives are not zero. And I have to say to that comment, I think as a parent, it's deeply troubling that my kid who's healthy, good vitamin D levels. 30 seconds. Um, not wear a mask. Um, so it's this president said, it's important for children to see facial expressions of their peers and adults around them to learn social cues. So we know that masks are not benign. And finally, um, this was really cool to me because we're always focused on masking up the kids because we're all literally terrified our kids are going to get sick. I get that. But several doctors this person spoke to pointed out that the best way to shield children from COVID um, is through adult vaccination. A most effective way of protecting everyone, students, school, staff alike, is by vaccinating the adults around them. And so I think that's really good news. And I think because kids are at very low risk of COVID, there was a man in Bedford who talked about his daughter got it and was in the hospital, and he does not expect everybody to wear a mask because of it. It is rare, and I'm so sorry it happened to the gentleman whose son was sick. It does happen, but I don't believe, Matt, I think you're causing other problems, and I just would like parents to have the choice. Thank you. Thank you. And I mentioned it earlier, if you have something you'd like to give to Danae, you can do that tonight or email it to us. If you've already done that, uh, we are forwarding everything to Danae, so she will have that. So if you're reading off of something or talking about something you already sent us, then no need to resend it and uh, waste your, your time having to create another email. So I will go to the four line again. If you can introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Julie Smiley. I live in Amherst and have kids in the school district. First, I want to thank everyone, especially our teachers, who worked tirelessly to support our children's education last year. Amherst did an absolutely phenomenal job, and I hope we can achieve similar results this year. Most of us share the same end goal here, I think, which is ensuring our children have as normal a school year as possible, that they can remain in school in person. Our best chance of achieving that is complying with CDC, AMA, and AAP recommendations that masks are required when indoors, regardless of vaccine status, especially when social distancing cannot be maintained. And now we have the highly transmissible Delta variant, which is upping the ante here. Vaccine hesitancy, coupled with the fact that many of our students aren't even eligible yet, means we won't benefit from herd immunity, Masks are proven worldwide as an easy and efficient mitigator of transmission. Since we don't have funding to support dual modalities, we will have more kids in school, significantly limiting opportunities for social distancing. Community transmission is increasing dramatically right now. Without the recommended precautions, we will see this mirrored in our schools. Our children will infect vulnerable members of our community our neighbors, our friends, our families, our teachers, and our healthcare professionals. Quarantine requirements will impact our neighbors' ability to work and to maintain their income. The inevitable consequence is another lockdown, just as we're seeing in other countries and in states where the adequate proportions are not being implemented, and none of us want that. Optional masking for children in school is not going to be effective. Of course, children don't want to wear masks. Mine don't want to eat vegetables occasionally or go to bed at a reasonable time. It'll be impossible for parents to enforce mask wearing while their kids are in school. It's unfair to burden our teachers with that responsibility. Mask wearing is far less effective when it's inconsistent. Our school system was successful last year with masking in place. Our children did not suffer unduly because of that requirement. Our children suffered when they were forced into remote education. Masks are not a huge imposition. I implore the, bo the board to uphold those same standards this year regarding masks 
to keep our kids in school in person. Wearing a mask is really a relatively small inconvenience 30 with seconds. enormous benefits for our children and our communities. It is far less damaging than remote school is. I hope at the high school there's room to revisit optional masking if transmission rates become an issue. Finally, we cannot allow our democratic process to be co-opted by disruptive and disrespectful individuals who represent the minority of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smiley. Yes, sir, up to you now. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, my name is Sam Ayala. I live here in Amherst. Um, I definitely want a third what the teacher spoke about. I think the kids being outside is the best. Um, I, recently, I recently lived in Texas, and um, it's funny how up here we have a flu season, um, but it's only when we have the most least amount of sunlight and vitamin D levels. Down in Texas, we did not have a flu season. Um, that being said, we're always outside. Kids are always healthy. Yeah, I, my kids didn't want to eat vegetables too. He doesn't even want to eat meat, but he's completely fine. Um, I did send over to all of you, I think, except to Mr. Jack, Jake, Jack, um, an article by Dr. Vernon Coleman, uh, proof that masks do not, that they do more harm than good. It's 111 facts um, that masks actually can do more harm. Um, and I just want to just read maybe one or two, but pretty much one of the things that could happen is pulmonary infection in the lungs just from the fabrics that can happen. It's as simple as that. There's a study right on it. Um, I can share it to anyone who would like it. Um, also, reading right off of the covid19.newhampshire.gov, between the ages of zero and 19, there have been zero deaths whatsoever in any case with children um, or from the age of 19. Between 20 and 29, there's been one death. Um, that being said, if we're going off of cases, COVID's not going anywhere. It's just like the flu. There'll just be another variant and another variant, just like the flu has been around for 30 plus years and we still have a flu. No matter how many flu shots you give, they're going to continue telling you there's a new one because there's a new variant. So nothing's going to change. Um, we're not asking for completely banning the mask. We're just make it optional. Just if we feel our children are healthy enough to not wear a mask, then let them go in. Um, if you want to have your children wear a mask, that's fine. If your child decides to take their mask off and trade them around, because I guarantee that's what's going to happen. One's going to come home with a Spider-Man one one day, and then there's another one uh, the, the next day. That's fine. That's your child. Just don't tell me how to mask or unmask my child. The same way I'm not going to tell you guys how to teach my child, because that's what you guys do. You guys teach and care for our children when they're not with us. So the trust that we have in you guys um, is very high. So when they are not with us, 30 seconds, we're hoping that you guys will treat them the same way you would treat your own children or our, or our beliefs, I guess. Um, but I just want to say thank you guys. And um, I hope we can come to a good conclusion. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. I don't think anybody wants me teaching their kids. So thankfully it's not, uh, not me. Yes, sir. Patrick Eggleston, nine Conifer Lane, Amherst, New Hampshire. Um, I was here the other night and listened to some of the things that were said and found them quite puzzling. I finally found, I think, the reference that people were talking about this um, professor that uh, from Stanford that has some interesting ideas, to put it mildly, about the use of masks. Um, but. A couple things. The information indicates that masks are safe for children if they're old over two. Well, since uh, you have to be a bit older than that to get into elementary school, I think they're pretty safe. Um, it is clear that not only do masks help prevent the spread of this disease, but there's evidence been brought out that it's also reducing the amount of flu that's going around. And so basically it's helpful for presumably any um, viral disease. What people have mentioned about vitamin D, I think that's a good point. If we could get more people to be taking 
uh, recommended dose of vitamin D, it could help some, but I still feel much safer with um, children wearing masks. And I hope that all the teachers and the students wear masks. And the fallacy of everybody doing their own thing is that if you choose to have your child not wearing a mask and they start spreading the disease, the other children that were doing the right thing are gonna maybe still get the disease. It depends how good the masks are, how good the room ventilation is and so on. Um, again, masks are safe for any child over two. I'm a grandfather, I have two grandchildren in the school system, one in fourth grade, one in 10th grade, and I'm very much hoping they live to graduate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, just so uh, everybody's aware, we, we've reached that half hour mark, but the four people that are standing up right now, you will all have your three minutes. If anybody else jumps in line after them, we'll go down to two minutes for those folks, but just know that everybody that's in line right now, you do have uh, three minutes each as we continue on. So we will uh, go to the, uh, I, I hate, you're right, Lee, the, the term against line is tough to say, but we'll, for lack of a better term, we'll use that, the against microphone. I'm Kathy Levin, I live in Amherst. I wanna make a few comments about science in general. The reason for it is that there was a post on the Amherst Facebook page the other day by someone who spoke last Thursday about mandatory masking. He was appalled by what he referred to as rude and disrespectful behavior here at the last board meeting by some of the parents who want masks optional. And there were a few instances of rude behavior that should not have happened. But what I consider even more appalling is the 400 plus comments to that post with the majority stating that those of us who do not want our children masked in school don't care about other people and don't believe in science. Neither of those is true, and I reject their characterization. Science is not supposed to take place in an echo chamber. It is not meant to be an exercise in group think or a way to force people to bend to your will. And I think that some people have forgotten this. Science is a process of learning about the natural world through observation and experimentation. It starts with curiosity. It begins with a question. While we have a huge body of agreed upon scientific knowledge, rarely is science settled. We believe certain concepts unless or until new knowledge is presented that makes us change our minds. And sometimes the information we have is incomplete or uncertain. Sometimes the science is wrong. There was a time when it was believed that bad humors in the body caused illness. The number one treatment was bloodletting. Wash your hands was once considered controversial advice. We think how silly, but that was the prevailing science at the time. More recently are the instances of certain medications being removed from the market after further scientific investigation revealed unintended consequences, such as birth defects. My point here is that through inquiry, observation, data collection, and healthy and vigorous open debate, science moves forward. Scientists often disagree. Experts in their respective fields often disagree. Doctors often disagree. That is why we sometimes seek a second opinion. Never underestimate the power of a question. If we cannot ask questions about the science, then it is no longer science, it is dogma. And a few steps past dogma is a slide to propaganda. All of us here care about our children as well as the children who may be in our care or we wouldn't be here tonight. 30 seconds. Those of us who would like a mask optional policy do not think that the mandatory masking of our children is necessary nor do we think that is this supported by science, but we would not demand that no one be able to wear a mask if they choose. It would be nice if this courtesy was extended the other way instead of attempting to impose their will on everyone with mandatory masking for all. Thank you. Thank you. Three minutes when you're ready. If, if I can ask if it's possible, uh, maybe remove the mask. It's hard to hear with the microphone anyway with the rain. Um, Thank you. <laughs> In a hurricane. Uh, Jessica Riley Greer, Amherst. I have two young children in the district. Um, I'd like to make a plea that the school board required masks for a yellow, orange, and red status colors and group student classes into pods as we did last year. Um, 
I work with people all over the world, many of them whose children didn't have a chance to go to school at all. We in this district were very blessed with all the actions the school district, the school board, the superintendent took to ensure the safety and health of our children, staff, teachers, and in essence, our community. Um, on the New Hampshire site, I saw that we only had 16 cases last year at Clark Wilkins. And quite frankly, you are making decisions in the unknown still a year and a half later. Um, we don't know the exact impact on COVID-19 on children, but we know that it poses a health and safety risk to children and the greater community. Um, we don't know those long-term impacts. There were people that cited no deaths, things like that, but we don't know those long-term impacts. Um, we know the current variants are more contagious than before. We know that places where we're seeing surges, there's a lot more children being hospitalized currently today. Um, and we have determined that layered protection is the best defense. A lot of these items have been discussed, vaccinations, hand washing, social distancing, outdoor um, play. Um, and I firmly believe that masks also provide that uh, layered protection for the best defense. Um, it reduces the transmission. And I think, as I stated, our district is a case study for how well we can manage this process and provide our children with the education that they need and keep our teachers, staff, and community safe. Um, additionally, I'd like to raise the point that currently exposure points are going to be increasing this year as people are returning to work um, outside of their homes and also traveling more often for work. Um, and so for all of those points, uh, I'm just pleading that we can have masks in yellow so that we can avoid orange um, and avoid uh, potential outbreaks, even um, prevent transmission. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you're ready, sir. Joe Doobie, I am Hearst resident. What I would like to hear is we have the choice. New Hampshire state motto is live free or die. Live free is the key point then. I wanna be able to make my own choice. This also being with my own children. I want them to be able to wear the mask or not based on my choice, not anyone else's choice because I still have a freedom of choice. I am an adult, I am a parent. I should be able to make the choice of my own child. Now, if somebody else would like to do that with theirs, please go ahead, no judgment, nothing. I think that as we have it writ, that is perfectly fine to keep masks only in orange and close the school at red. Okay, that should be fine. Now, if other people would like it a little bit tighter, I think that we are very smart people in this room I think that we have the ability to group students based on their parents' choices before classes start. So now we have, say, 50% one way, 50% the other way. We have roughly, let's just throw out a number, eight different classes in each one of these school uh, groups, say first grade. I don't know what the actual number is. I apologize. What's the possibility of having four of these classrooms follow the mask decisions of those who would like their children to be masked, keep those four in a pod, and then allow the rest of us to do whatever we would like with our children. If our children would like to wear the mask or not, that can be our choice. You can still keep the children moving around in pods like you have proven to be effective last year. You can also allow us the choice to mask or not. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And this will be our last speaker uh, in the three minute category. After this one, we will go to two minutes apiece. Okay, my name is Pete Moresco. I'm in Mosswood Circle in Amherst. I'm here again to urge you to consider using masks even in the yellow time frame. I know a lot of people are looking for data to prove whether or not masks work. So I went through and I was trying to find some studies. And there, there are always studies that are gonna show one way or the other. And that's the problem with the masks right now. To do a true full controlled test with the mask 
versus not mask is not really possible because what are you going to do intentionally infect you know 500 people with the disease and see if they spread it versus the 500 that have masks no it can't be done so there is data one way or the other i was looking for studies and what uh, i found two that show the impact on the amount of fluids that are you know let out versus and what's the reduction in the amount that comes in I don't want to go through the numbers. What I do want to talk about is there was a study by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and they talked about how due to the lack of control data, what they want to use is they call it an integrative systems view of efficacy. And it means it's not just the impact on an individual. You want to look at the overall impact to the community. The part that I wanted to talk about is it, it says, it states that when human activities may lead to morally unacceptable harm that is scientifically plausible but uncertain, actions shall be taken to avoid or diminish that harm. This was written in terms of mandates when they were put in initially, but I think it applies here. It's uncertain what this disease does. I hear people say, you know, well, kids just recover. That means they're cavalierly assuming that there are no long-term effects on kids that have this disease. Nobody knows that. So I'm thinking, you know, from this, this integrative approach, you take, they, have, they use what they call the precautionary principle. 30 seconds, sir. Okay, thank you. You have uncertainty, so you have a choice. Do we start with masks and go for two weeks and say, oh, we don't need them and take them off? No harm, no foul for two weeks. Or do you let the kids go unmask and you'll see, well, look, now we have 15 students sick and you know 55 family members that are sick. Now we should put the masks in. I would take, I would take the precautionary approach. People complain about cloth masks, use disposable masks. I'll volunteer to offer a thousand disposable masks for the first day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A couple of young ladies on the right, uh, please. Hi. Um, my name's Lily. Um, I live in Mont, Mont Vernon. Um, I've basically, I've grown up in the um, Mont Vernon school unit and so Moving into Amherst is a really big and like new thing for me to go through. And with like all this COVID stuff and the masks, it's kind of hard to like interact with people because I don't know anybody there. Like this is a totally new environment. And um, having to like meet new people and not know what half of their face looks like is just such a confusing thing especially for like minor, like younger kids in kindergarten. And just like having to keep your mask on all day, as we, someone pointed out earlier, it's like seven hours with our masks on with hardly any breaks. And I noticed that around the end of the year last year, um, a lot of people, even our teachers got quite tired of doing that. Um, and it's just been kind of hard on us. Um, I'm not really sure what to say, but it's just really hard to wear masks all the time. So. Thank you. Hi, Cindy Hi Irving, Pulpit Run. Um, my incoming third grader and kindergartner spent most of the summer mask free in summer camps, except when they were indoors or they couldn't socially distance. They don't fear the virus, they don't mind the masks. We've made the decision to start wearing masks again in public due to the rising numbers. A few years ago, my family contracted the common flu and it caused an autoimmune response in my otherwise healthy youngest daughter that made her body start attacking her blood platelets. I don't put her in a bubble, but I do think 10 steps ahead now. But it's hard to make decisions when you don't know the playing field, especially with less distancing and sanitization efforts this year. We're seeing juvenile cases rise and schools having to go remote in the South after just a few short weeks. I need my kids in school full time. 
But if masks are about protecting others versus ourselves, does my ability to make safe decisions for my children end at someone else's decision to send an unmasked child to school after say a big indoor public event? My kids would prefer no masks, but we talk about why we have started wearing them again. Not because of fear, but because there are people out there like my daughter who could be greatly impacted by a virus too small for us to see. I wanna believe parents will be honest and upfront, but recently I had an experience that reveals how naive that belief is. Last Monday, I dropped my kids off with a long trusted and beloved daycare provider they hadn't seen in over a year. On Wednesday, I received a text from them saying they hadn't been feeling well. So they took a test the previous Sunday, the day before they got there and just received a positive result. They put their own perceived needs over my children they were watching. They did not tell anyone they weren't feeling well or that they took a test. They did not quarantine while waiting the results. Perhaps they didn't want to or couldn't lose the income. 20 they, seconds. Sorry, thank, I didn't want to interrupt okay. your flow. Thankfully, my children have since tested negative, but, there were, but they were older than the other kids there and were not in super close proximity to her because they were outside most of the time. But so far, two of those six children have tested positive. This experience tells me that when it comes down to it, people will make decisions based on what's good for them, maybe what's good for their children, but not necessarily what's good for their child's friends or teachers or community. If masks are a barrier to protect our children from those who cannot or will not make the best decision for everyone, I am for it and I will hope you consider it. Thank you. When you're ready. Hi, Allie Norman, I'm from uh, Mount Vernon. Allie, can I have you a little closer to the mic? Sure, that rain's sorry. pretty loud. Um, you know, I keep hearing about um, this threat of shutting down the schools, like if there's too many cases, and I'm just wondering, why is that on the table? Why do we have to shut down the schools? Just keep them open. It's simple. If somebody's sick, then they should stay home. Um, also, it struck me as I was filling out my son's registration for the school year is that I have to sign off with a school nurse to give my kid ibuprofen or any of the other, um, you know, drugs that they have for them if they get a headache or whatever. But all of you are in a position to mandate my son cover his respiratory passages for seven hours a day. And if I was a board member, I wouldn't want anything to do with this. And I think Tom uh, was right on in wanting to protect the parents' right to choose because not one of you is qualified to make this decision. It's too messy, it's too controversial, and the science is far from settled. Um, so the only fair option is to leave it up to the parents. And um, also I keep hearing about um, you know, everyone needs to wear a mask in order for it to do any good. And, um, you know, we can't leave it up to individual people to do what's best for them. We have to make them do something um, to protect everybody else. And that's not America. America is about choice. It's about everyone doing their own thing, contrary to what the gentleman had said. That's what America is about. Uh, this isn't China. And I feel like mandating masks is a slippery slope in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. When you're ready. Hi, I'm Trish Burlack. I live on Middle Street in Amherst. I have two high school students and an eighth grader. I'm not a numbers person and I'm not a scientist, so I don't really have any facts and figures to share. Um, but I sort of have a few mantras that I live my life by. And one of them is when we know better, we do better. Um, and another one is we can't just think about ourselves. So when I think about masking in schools and mandating it or not, my first thought is if we think masks can help slow down transmission or even stop tra transmission for our kids, why wouldn't we want to do that? Because if there's a chance that it can help, I feel that that's what we should be doing. The other thing is when some children are wearing masks and some aren't, we already know that that is less effective than when everyone is wearing a mask. I wear a mask to protect others because I am not as concerned with how I will fare having, if I do get COVID and I actually did have COVID, um, my concern is more how I could be affecting someone else. And I think what makes me the most upset is when I hear people talking about personal freedom over the wellness of our community. And it's really important that we think from a standpoint of a community. This isn't just about whether your kid wants to wear a mask or whether it's comfortable on their face. When we know better, we do better. And maybe someday we will know better and we will say, you know what? Masks were just a pipe dream and they didn't do anything. But until we have that in front of us- 20 seconds. I say we go forward and keep these kids as safe as we know how. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anthony Nino, Amherst. Um, two minutes, I'll keep it quick. I'm an eight year Air Force Security Police veteran and I'm trained in nuclear, biological and chemical warfare. So um, this, the analogy that we were given for dealing with airborne pathogens was simple. If you went on vacation, would you lock your door, but not all of the windows? Well, no, because uh, a burglar could climb up a ladder and get in one of the windows. So um, I'm gonna use the same analogy uh, with this. If we're gonna prevent the spread of an infectious disease, we have to have a complete program. Masks, they are part of a program. Like, um, like our nurse said, they, uh, at a hospital, they use masks, they use booties. Um, it's a multifaceted program. So I'm gonna ask the board this, to consider that masks as only uh, by themselves are ineffective. We touch things, we touch our faces, uh, we cough, we sneeze, we breathe. Um, I would ask that we institute a program that says masks are optional. We stress to the kids that we sneeze and cough into uh, a handkerchief or a tissue and that uh, we wash our hands and we keep the windows open and the doors open to air out the place. Because with all the discussions that I've heard publicly in every public venue, there is yet to be a discussion about the filtration of the air. And that 30 is, seconds. And that is one of the most important aspects of keeping an airborne biological agent at bay, uh, the ventilation. Thank you. And I, I would ask uh, Superintendent Steele, uh, please share, share my correspondence uh, with the board. Will do, thank you. Thank you. We can try it with a mask on if we can speak. Oh, it's Lisa. I'm sorry. It's Lisa. Me. Like, yeah. Can, so Lisa yep. Eastland, Amherst. You'll be good. I'm going to try with the mask on because I've been all over the Southeast. So who knows what I've got? So um, Lily, I can't wait to see you at the middle school this year. I'm so excited. You're going to love it. Thank you for speaking out. I will state up front. I have mixed feelings about our students wearing masks in school. We know certain things. Everybody's the big organizations are recommending it. But the flip side is, especially in the younger set, it's hard to teach phonics and foundations and reading and all of those sound things when you can't see your mouth. So there's pluses and minuses to that. I'm gonna read fast and I'll email this to you. One of the things I'm not hearing in this discussion is the acknowledgement of all of the moving parts that keep a school running and deliver education to our students. It isn't just one teacher, one classroom. There are bus drivers, custodians, nurses, support staff, paraprofessionals, food services, and substitutes. Lots of moving parts that need to remain healthy to keep the ship afloat. Several years ago, for example, we almost had to cancel school for a day because of the number of ill bus drivers. Despite the larger than average daily pay rate for substitutes this year in Amherst, New Hampshire districts and ours still have a critical shortage of subs. We must keep things like this in mind because we want all of our students to be in school. Lastly, I'm not hearing about the economics of schooling. I'm a substitute teacher. If I need to quarantine because of an exposure in the classroom, I don't get paid. And that's the same for other hourly workers. I am fortunate. My last Amherst student is a junior. He's basically raising himself. He can quarantine and I can go to work. Even if he's in isolation and not that sick, I can still leave him on his own. I have no idea what parents of younger students 30 seconds. do in these situations. And I really, really don't know what single parents do. I appreciate the tiered system and the changing of the numbers. One of the things as, a, as an employee of the ASD to the school board, Never at one time was I polled or asked as, a, as an employee how I felt about any of this. I gave my opinion because I was part of the task force, but there was nothing that was sent out to the employees how we felt about any of this back to school um, information. Thank you. Thank you. When you're ready, sir. <clears throat> Andrew Warden, Amherst. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit on science. Um, the gentleman spoke a couple of times, uh, people ago was mentioning that there are no randomized control trials on masking. It's actually not true. There have been 14 since 2010. Um, 11 of them have shown no correlation whatsoever between masking and uh, illness. Um, three of them showed some correlation, it was very mild, but it actually was with N95 masks that were properly fitted. So the cloth diapers that people are wearing are not actually appropriate. Um, but leaving that aside, I'd like to talk a little bit about statistics. <clears throat> Since the beginning of the COVID era, um, 360 children under 18 have died because of COVID. It's roughly, just roughly, roughly 200 a year. 
Um, looking at the all-cause statistics, you can see that um, motor vehicle crashes are 20 times more likely. Um, cancer is 10 times more likely. Drowning is five times more likely. And strangely, the flu is exactly as likely. We do not do any of these mitigations for these other things. Why are we considering it for this? Um, and for the people who are really worried about their children, they can mask up. If they're really, really worried, they can have their kids work from home. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marcella Duby. I'm a resident of Amherst. Um, I don't have facts, I don't have figures, but I do have four children, all of whom who willingly wore masks all through school. One of the things that did impact them was when we weren't remote and I would do anything in my power to prevent that from happening again. And if that includes masks, which doesn't actually have that much of an imposition on their well-being then so be it. And as for personal choice and freedom, I know someone's gonna ping me for this, but wearing a seatbelt protects you and it's the law and you wear it. If you choose not to wear your seatbelt, it doesn't impact me if we get into an accident. So I feel that it is within our best interest that when cases rise, that we do follow the science and that we do protect others, our teachers and other staff in our school district. And I just wanna thank you for last year. You guys did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Cack Lee, if I can ask yeah. the, uh, the the woman oh, behind you there, yeah, I can't I see faces know. in the dark. So if she hasn't gone yet, would you yeah, be willing I to let her go first? She, she thank you. Prepping, so I'll let her go first. If she's not ready, that's fine. I at least that's want to offer it to her. her. So yeah. thank I'm you. on the spot now. <laughs> okay. No Sorry. pressure. All right. Um, Vanessa from Amherst. Um, I wanted to thank you guys. I forgot to thank you last week for all your hard work and all the hours that you've put into this. Um, I just have a a problem. I'm, I am against mandating masks, and I do implore that you make that optional. Um, but my concern is why we're starting in a yellow and why we're not starting in a green. Um, I think as of today, Amherst has 17 cases and Mount Vernon has zero. So I'm super confused why we're jumping in at a yellow with so few cases in our town. Um, so that's something I just wanted to bring up there. Um, it doesn't seem to make sense to mask our babies right now when there's so few cases, which kind of brings me to the next point I brought up last time, um, just about the color codes. Again, we, we have to look again at changing those colors, not to cases, but to hospitalizations and deaths. Because if we keep it at cases, masks are going nowhere. They're gonna be here forever because the cases will go up and there will always be cases. So I really implore you to check on um, the color coding and to really um, think about making that different in terms of hospitalizations and, and unfortunately even deaths. Um, but please don't mask our babies this in putting them in yellow right away. Um, let's look at green to start with and make yellow um, optional. Um, please give the parents the choice. That's what we ask. That's what we've all been asking. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alice Cotton. I'm from Amherst and I'm a super introvert. So I'll try and keep this under two without shaking. Um, not a meditated speech. I've just been listening to people's comments and um, taking notes. So I love live free or die New Hampshire. Um, I don't think it's an American thing not to, to be free everywhere. We've banned cigarettes inside buildings in many places for the health of other people. Um, we all love our kids. I don't negate that. Uh, personally, not terrified of my kids getting sick. I think it's good for them. Um, but I am terrified of being responsible for someone else's illness or death. Um, I don't know about national studies. I'm proud of our schools and our district and how successful we were this year, keeping our cases low compared to other schools doing what we were doing, which was sanitizing and distancing and even masks. And I hate masks and my kids hate masks and I will rip this off when we get out, but for now, I will do this for you. Um, 
Um, I think we did a great job educating our kids. And I know, I don't know about other classrooms, but my kids did a great job or their teachers did a great job of getting them outside unmasked and um, keeping them safe and still teaching them. Thank you to our PTA for our outdoor classrooms. That was amazing. 30 seconds. Um, I agree this isn't going anywhere. Kids are getting it and they're finding links to dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, like chicken pox leads to shingles, again. Um, my question is, somebody brought up, a lot of people have brought up pods. And in my church, we have the option to wear masks or not. But those who want to wear masks have a place for them to be distanced and still wear their masks. I wonder if, and I know the classrooms are already determined, but is it possible to keep those who wish their kids to be masked in a pod together? and those who are adamant against them to be allowed to be free in their pod, would that perhaps be a good, um, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. And I guess that's my point, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Greg Fritz, Amherst. Um, I wanna make one point very clear up front. Um, you know, I. We talked about the data that the masks are not known to have any real impact on transmission. So to a lot of the families here that are have kids that are vulnerable, I just hope that you don't count on the masks to keep your kids safe. If you have, you know, that situation, something a lot of people do. Um, I know it's confusing for a lot of people. I'm very confident to tell you that the masks are indifferent from wearing uh, nothing at all. So um, you know, talk to your doctor, babe, or something like that, but just please don't count on the masks. Um, and again, the idea about risk management, like you say, someone said, uh, you know, if, if this was nothing, at least I've done, so done something. Well, they do nothing. So do something, you know, like maybe you have to isolate your kid or something else. I, I don't know all about the medicine. I know about the masks and they're, um, not effective. So whatever this board decides, I hope that your kids are all kept safe. Um, some of the points I wanted to make, I took notes as well. Um, you know, probably the experts, you know, the European CDC recommends no masking in those schools. Those kids are all going to school without mask requirements. Um, the WHO recommends no masking for kids under six and those between six and 11 have to have parental uh, consent. Um, it's only in this country that we have this controversy. I don't understand the politics. I'm just a scientist. I don't know if we vote for masks optional, if Trump becomes a math teacher, I don't understand it. Um, but the idea that, Matt, that the experts agree, you know, it was all agree on the science. 30 seconds. Everyone says it, CDC says it's mass are inconclusive. WHO is mass are inconclusive. Every study shows mass are inconclusively different from nothing. Just take from that what you will, uh, vote for what you will. We're gonna do best for our kids. If it's unsafe, we'll pull our kids out. You always have the option to withdraw your kids temporarily, work between homeschool, going in person. You could, the VLAX program, you know, the CDC recommends no more than two hours of screen time for most of the young kids. Our policy today will violate the CDC's recommendation on that. Masking parents, teachers, that girls vaccination says we violate that process. We're violating lots of CDC recommendations in this process. The mask is one more thing to violate. It's the right thing to do. And our kids need to be told that they're safe and the masking doesn't help you. Thank you. Thank you. When you're ready. Thank you. I'm Tiani Coleman here in Amherst. And uh, the first thing I wanted to say is just that we did a very good job last year. And I think because of that, and because not only did we do well here in Amherst and in the school district, but also in New Hampshire as a whole, I think a lot of us believe that perhaps it's really not that big of a deal because you know most people fared okay last year. And I think it's important that we think very strongly about how things have changed. The Delta variant is much worse. It is affecting children in much larger numbers. It's affecting, it's even causing breakthrough cases, whereas the other variant was not causing so many breakthrough cases in vaccinated individuals. Um, also, the vaccines are starting to wane, and so some of our most vulnerable who got them long ago are now more vulnerable than they were before, all because of the Delta variant. Uh, children are being affected in much higher numbers. So I think that we need to uh, the, the numbers right now are much worse than they were last year at this time, and yet last year we took a lot of precautions. So this year we really need to take just as many precautions. Things are not, this, this, this uh, pandemic is not over, and we see that happening in a lot of other places. 
around us where things are really turning south quickly, and we don't want that to happen here. We want things to stay good like they were last year. Um, and I hate to say good because a lot of people were detrimentally affected last year as well, but it will be even worse this year. 30 seconds. Um, I, I'm concerned about people speaking as though there is no science, it's all up in the air, it's not settled. Sure, it's not 100% settled, but there has been a lot of science and most of the experts and most of the scientists say that masks are what we need to do and that they work best if everybody does them and not if just a few people do them. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled, the US Supreme Court has ruled that we can have mandates and whatnot in the interests of public health. And this is one of those situations where we have the interest of public health. Nobody wants to wear a mask, but we're a lot better off if we do prevent this rather than wait until it's already a disaster. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, I will let you go. I'm not going to interrupt you again this time, but I do want to let everybody know that with all the rain that we've had, uh, there are our police outside saying that the roads are getting a little flooded around here, as we all know that they tend to do. So just be aware of that. If the rain continues to go, we may have to make some decisions uh, about um, moving things or, or getting people out of here so you can actually get home. But I just want everybody to know that that's the case now. So if you are a leery rain driver, you may want to uh, hit, the, hit the bricks now or grab a canoe and find your way home. So <laughs> now you can go, Lee. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Lee Kakmar, 15 Mac Hill. A couple of things I want to say. Every single person who's gotten up, who's a parent, who adores their child, it is wearing a mask and wants their kid to wear a mask starts with, I'm no scientist. Um, we've presented a lot of data. <laughs> and in fact, I read from the CDC's own paper that they have not found an appreciable st statistically significant benefit of wearing a mask. And I like the gentleman's comment about, make sure you know that if your kid is immunocompromised, it's not really helping you at all and you don't wanna have that false sense of security. But one thing I wanna say is that's an emotional argument. I'm not a scientist, but I have four kids. We have five kids between each other. We all have kids and we all don't want them to get sick. But I think it's the way we approach not getting sick. As it's been mentioned, vitamin D is huge. If you, there was a study of moderate to severe COVID outcomes and hospitalizations, 94% of people who got severe COVID had very low vitamin D levels. So that's a super easy thing you can all give your kids. I'm serious, you, they won't get the flu. They will not get sick. But the other thing is testing cases. Please don't base your level on cases. It's about cases does not equal 30 sickness. Seconds. As you heard, the PCR doesn't, it's not, accurate. Um, so if we focus on hospitalizations and sadly death, that would be a more accurate so we don't punish. And I just want parent rights to choose because clearly we were operating on different levels of compassion. I mean, it's coming, it's the same compassion, but it's different ways to approach it. So I hope that is honored. Thank you. Thank you. Shanna Gascoigne, uh, Amherst. So I am not here tonight to share my opinion because my opinion really does not matter. Um, I have been listening closely. I watched the meeting last week. It's clear that the public school system is an integral and important part of many lives. Um, and it's evident that we are all mourning the loss of what the public school has always been and meant and how it's felt to us uh, because of how the pandemic has shifted it. <clears throat> and we were all uh, experiencing a really close to normal summer. So this variant and any potential disruption that it could cause is a really hard pill to swallow um, for me too. What's on the table uh, before you tonight is to listen to all of the comments, peel back the emotion and passion, and to adopt a plan that takes into account the most updated science, data and recommendations from the leading public health authorities that is available to you right now. Because that is, as it has been stated, you're not scientists, you're not. So all you can do is rely on the data and the science from those leading health organizations. Um, wherever you land, you will most certainly fail to please all of your constituents, but that's not the task at hand. The task at hand is finalizing a plan for school, which starts in a week so that teachers, students, and families can begin planning and expectation setting. 
I support the administration and the board. I support the multi-tiered color system that allows superintendent the capacity to adjust public health mitigation strategies. 30 seconds. Shane. As we learn more and, and can do better, as has been stated by many in the room tonight, um, within the local schools and should local and regional conditions warrant. So um, finally, thank you all um, and good luck to you wherever you land tonight. We parents look forward to hearing that. Thanks. Thank you. Sam Ayala, uh, Amherst here. I just wanna say, <clears throat> when children are wearing masks, how do you know if they're depressed? How do you know if they're having a bad day? We did have a bad incident last year with a, with a boy that, God rest his soul. But besides leaving our home, how do you know if a child is being abused if he's wearing a mask? How do you know? We know what happened to that little boy, Gabriel Fernandez, God rest his soul. He was abused by his own parents and his own teachers saw it and they did nothing about it. You guys are the second line of defense. Let God forbid you have a crazy parent. Maybe they probably think we're crazy for not sending our kids a mask, whatever. But if the, if, if you, if you guys can read that and stop something, God forbid, from happening, right there is what happens with that life. If you guys are so concerned about that one life, you know, my child with autoimmunity, I'm sorry for all that, but how about for that one child that something horrible could happen to? So I just, you're hiding so much behind that. Everyone is beautiful under those masks. All of you, everyone in this room. So let's just... Share those beautiful faces. That's it. And just give us our choice. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Martha Corcus. I uh, live on Buckridge Drive in Amherst. I have two kiddos in high school, and I am a fifth grade teacher, but not in town. Um, and I just thought it was important to step up and talk a little bit about masks from a teacher's point of view. Um, in high school, you know, the, most of the kids are vaccinated, um, and that's fantastic. I don't have to worry too, too much, um, hopefully, about my kids in high school. But as a teacher of fifth grade, my kiddos are not going to be vaccinated. So when I go in as a teacher, I'm the only one who's vaccinated. Um, if one of the kids has COVID, and they trans, the transmission is there, I could come home with it. I, it could affect other people around me. Um, so therefore, with a lot of thought, and I won't say where I teach, but um, the area in which I teach is going full mask um, because there are so many kids. Live free or die is great. And I love that idea. Have lived in New Hampshire a long time, but our decisions have ripple effects. I, you know, um, hate masks. They're not fun. I don't enjoy in classroom having masks, but kids are really adaptable. And we can tell when they're struggling. There's lots of ways we can tell seconds. besides looking at their beautiful faces, which I love doing and really miss. But we need to be aware that our decisions affect everyone. And if it helps just one kid not get sick or one adult not get sick, I'm all for it because it's a community like Mrs. Burlack talked about. It's a community and we need to help one another and protect one another. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Tim, if you're good, I'm gonna let this gentleman speak here. He is oh, he's not gone yet. yet. No, he is not. Uh, I have, uh, has the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just telling my wife that my son's calling okay. out of the blue. Uh, Seth Smiley, Amherst, thank you for having me tonight. I spoke uh, last week as well. A couple different things. I, I like to at least think of myself as a person that can change their opinion or belief system based upon evidence and new information. Right now, the information that I believe are that masks are helpful and I don't believe that optional masks will work. Kids will succumb to peer pressure. At least the information that I have so far is that two people wearing a mask are safer than one. The other information I did just read before coming here is that at least in the first three European countries that I looked at, 
with recent news in August is that they will be going back to school with masks indoors. So I did want to state that. The other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have a little bit of an issue with is, again, this is just based upon the information that I have right now, is that when you have a parent saying, like, you do you and I'll do me, I don't view that as a level playing field. Because at least with my beliefs, if my child is wearing a mask, he or she may, is not going to affect your child's health. If your child is not wearing a mask, they could, I'm not saying they will, but they could affect mine. So I'd be back at the school with a mask mandate in yellow and please do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, sorry, I, I, sorry, I was waiting. I saw Tim acknowledge it, so I did not, uh, I did not acknowledge it in turn. You are more than welcome to go. I'm Sarah Gallo. I'm at 18 Old Manchester Road in Amherst. Um, hello to neighbors I haven't met. <laughs> um, I would like to say I have two children in the district. I have an incoming kindergartner, and that's really hard to think about him coming into kindergarten um, wearing a mask. But I support the decision that you all are making, um, you know, if that's what's in the best interest of the community. Um, I will say that my daughter was remote all of last year, except for the last three weeks of school. Um, she wore a mask for the last three weeks of school, even though I think it was the maybe the last week and a half, it was optional. Um, and she was saddened because given the option, there were a lot of friends that she knew um, that their parents had requested them to wear a mask. They didn't wear them. The teachers can't enforce it. Um, and there was quite a bit of heckling um, and jeers in her direction for wearing a mask, which was really unfortunate. Um, so one thing I'm not sure if the board has considered, but maybe talking to um, some of the, the middle schoolers about the situation or even the elementary school kids, I mean, some of them can speak to their experience. I know my daughter did not mind wearing a mask at all. 30 my, seconds. My son doesn't mind either. Um, and it's really encouraging to hear from the board, the numbers um, from the power school survey that support um, mask wearing. Um, uh, that's it. I appreciate everything. Thank you. So as we are, Tim, you are uh, you are up now. But as we are into our, our repeat customers, if you will, I will uh, limit it to these last two gentlemen that will speak here, and then we will move on with tonight's um, tonight's conversation for the board. So Tim, you are you have Thank the floor you. for two minutes. I just wanted to wrap up here. What are we really doing to our children? This is the largest case of Munchausen by proxy I've ever seen in my life. We're passing on a psychotic, delusional hypochondria onto our children. But I get it. You watch the news every day. You see the death ticker scrolling on the right side. You see the death ticker at the bottom of your screen. Every story. Every expert, every interview, interview is doom and gloom, gloom and death and horror. Oh, and it's going to get worse with the fall surge and the Delta variant. You're in inundate, inundated with fear, and we have no right to pass that fear on to our children. I recommend testing is between a parent and their doctor, assurance that kids will not be dropped off at school with a fever, they'll be sent home immediately, temperature checks, and masks are optional. And honestly, if you want COVID to stop, stop going to get tested when you have the sniffles. There's still colds out there. There's still influenza, and people get sick from those colds. The test is insanely inaccurate. The test is insanely inaccurate and cannot distinguish between COVID and the flu. That's why they're replacing it at the end of the year. Stop testing healthy people and children. What is the outcome you get when you test anyway? Is there some treatment paradigm that they'll give you? No, those have been blocked and you're sent home and told to drink water. That is exact advice my son received when he got it last year at college. Go home and drink water. 30 seconds. Normalcy will not return until we stop feeding the cases engine. What is needed is an injection of common sense and to turn off our TVs. And sorry, um, this is causing a lot of damage to our kids. Depression rates are at the highest. Suicide rates have tripled. This is not good for our kids. This fear we're putting on them is not good for them. 
Thank you. And then our final customer tonight, Mr. Morasco. Pete Morasco from Amherst. I guess in my terms, I don't look at it as fear. I think we see enough proof of the sickness spreading, the horrors that are happening. So I don't think it's fear, it's caution. The two things I wanted to address, everybody talks about data and I was told, you know, we have a number of studies that show masks are ineffective. This, the paper that I read talked about studies that showed masks were ineffective that are being used now to, to be against masks, but also said that it was found that four of those major studies were flawed. They've rescinded them, but the people that are against masks are refusing to accept that. They're still using flawed data to support it. So that's one thing. Data is going to be manipulated. And Adam, you remember my favorite saying on the school board, you got to be careful with numbers because four out of three people struggle with math, right? <laughs> so be careful with the data. The other problem I have is when people say, you know, we, we don't worry about cases because there's only 17 in Amherst or whatever. Well, that's fine if your child is never going to leave the town of Amherst and never come into contact with anyone who's been outside of Amherst, but that's the problem. They go anywhere on the weekends. You can't control where people go. You can't have unvaccinated people that don't have symptoms that will spread the disease. 30 seconds. That's the caution there. And like I said, there are so many unknowns with this right now. I truly believe in terms of the overall community, worrying about everyone else, not just yourself, the best thing to do for these kids and staff to keep them safe is to use masks to start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I missed the gentleman that was down there. Uh, so I apologize, sir. This will be our final, final, final customer tonight. So uh, when you're ready, you have two minutes. That's fine. Uh, Craig Kelly, Amherst resident. Um, and I apologize. I'm not even gonna need the full two minutes. I came here with no intent of speaking, just a hearing after last week's meeting. And if we, if it wasn't for recordings, we could I could have stood in the middle and spoken to everybody. But after hearing both sides and everybody regurgitating information and facts and this and that, the only fact I have is my oldest daughter who's going to be entering kindergarten asked me, hey, daddy, I want to wear my, my mask going into school. Not, and I'll repeat what everybody said. We're not scientists. None of us are. But to talk out of both sides of our mouths and say, you know, Mr. Ayala brought up a really good point about the, the unfortunate incident that happened last year. Maybe if we saw his face, it wouldn't have happened. Maybe if he was in school and not stuck at home it wouldn't have happened. We don't know. Like none of us do, because there is no professionals. As far as getting facts on either side, it depends on which channel you watch. Let's be honest. It's, again, I stand on both sides here. All I know, the only fact that I have is that my daughter asked me to wear it. And again, somebody mentioned numerous times, I'll regurgitate, even though I said I wouldn't, level playing fields. If everybody wears a mask, it's some protection. I don't care if you don't believe it isn't. I've got filtration systems in my mask it helps somewhat. And if everybody's doing it, it's going to help. But I'm not a scientist. I, I won't sit here and say that I know that for a fact. I think it does, though. Uh, and that's my belief. So I think if we could level the playing field, as much as everybody says they don't like the mask, I think if everybody wore it, it will help somewhat. So again, I appreciate your time, guys. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So that will conclude our public comment for tonight. I appreciate everybody's uh, comments and everybody showing up. Um, and again, it doesn't sound like it's rained a little bit. So hopefully the driveways have, have emptied out, uh, if you needed to, uh, to get out of here, but, um, we will continue on now with, uh, the board discussion, if you will, from, uh, we'll continue essentially what we talked about last week. Um, first things first though, I will need a motion from somebody on the board to, um, open up the floor for discussion by a motion to accept the reopening plan as was approved by the SAU board last week. I'll motion. I have a motion by Terry in a second. I'll second. Okay, I have a second from Josh. And so now uh, we can open for discussion. And, and I will just say one last thing. I do apologize if, uh, if anybody is offended by my informality. I don't always hear the last names, um, but it's easier to do it that way. I can remember first names much easier. So if I offended you, I do apologize by uh, referring to you in a first name manner. And same for my fellow board members. It's uh, much easier by first name. So. I will open for discussion. Whoever would like to start? It looks like Ms. Parisi would like to go first. I would like to. Um, I would like to move that we add a line to the reopening plan regarding lunch. 
Would you like me to read what I have planned? Uh, that would be great if this is an official motion, yes. Yep, it's an official motion. Um, administration will develop a plan to allow some classes on a rotation to eat lunch in the cafeteria or outdoors while maintaining appropriate distancing. The other classes will eat lunch in the classroom or outdoors. This would apply to the yellow, our yellow bullet points, as well as our orange bullet points I already have it on there. So this would just apply to yellow. So would you not move to put this in in the green status? You would allow, you would be meaning that you would, uh, you, you're not as concerned about this in green status. Then. Correct. Yellow, okay. orange, red. Can we get a second and then open for discussion? I'll second. All right. uh, Terry had the second. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any thoughts on this? I know I just brought up the, the one thought I had. If, if we are in green, I don't know if this motion, this amendment is needed other than if we express this desire to Mr. Steele that we encourage them. We don't have... Um, for lack of a better term, there's no way for us to enforce this. We don't have, you know, none of us are lunch monitors, and I certainly don't want to spend my day doing that. But I think that if we trust the administration to do that and express our desires, I don't think it hurts to have it in there, but I don't know if it necessarily needs to be an official amendment. Those are my initial thoughts on this. But I'm open, for, I'm more than willing, I support it. I just don't know if it has to be an amendment inside of the, inside of the reopening plan. Can I give some background as to my thought? Please do. Um, I think it's important for our families and our students and parents to know what to expect going into the school year. Um, I think we have some families who are hesitant on putting all of our students in an unmasked environment. And I think that this is um, also appropriate for some allowing for some social distancing where we do have that ability. I would agree. I think that setting expectations is a huge part of all of this, right? Is, is having families know what to expect. And that's why people are waiting on, um, on pins and needles right now to figure out what we're going to do so they can make a plan. Are we going shopping or are we not? Do I need to make sure I have a whole week's worth of masks ready and clean? Do I not? So anything we can do to be clear about our intentions and our expectations and to be clear with families for what to expect, I think it is useful. Sorry. Anybody else have any further thoughts on this? I would just say I agree with Mrs. Beam that um, clarity is important. So adding this clarity into the yellow status, I think, would be would be okay. helpful. Uh, I will call for a vote. Uh, because we're all in person, we don't need to do a roll call vote. We had to do that Thursday. If you weren't here, we had to say last names and announce it because we had folks that were joining by Zoom. But now that we're all here, we do not have to do that. So. All in favor of Ms. Parisi's amendment, adding the line regarding lunch, which I can hope that you would uh, forward to uh, Superintendent Steele when the time comes. All in favor? Aye, five ayes and zero against. So that motion passes five to nothing. And I presume, Adam, that this gets added to our part of the plan, not necessarily the others, but I assume it's good practice if you wanted to mention it to them what we did. Indeed. Okay. Okay, next topic. Who would like to continue on tonight? I have plenty of thoughts, so I will share mine if, if we're ready, but I, I want to open the floor as chair for other people to get theirs in first. Okay, I'll, I'll go with another one. Um, <laughs> I would like us to talk about our outdoor classroom expectations, our outdoor use of space. Okay. Um, do I need to make an official motion? No, I, that, I think, is again, this is, I think as, as a board, I don't know that we need to litter this with amendments in terms of um, declarations, essentially, um, you know, not unlike the Declaration of Independence, where they made the list of grievances against the king. I don't know that we need to have the list of items that we want to undertake. I think that this is uh, Adam is here. Um, he was not the deaf one that couldn't hear people earlier. It was not him. So I think that he can understand our intentions. And I think that um, this is something that has been stressed to administrators already. Um, but in the teachers already, but I do think uh, I agree that it is important that we try to get kids outside when the weather permits. Um, and so I will actually, I can ask you, Adam, what is the best mechanism for us to do this? Is it word of mouth that we talk right now? I mean, do we need a, an official amendment for this? Or we, can we just encourage you to encourage teachers? What's the best policy, the most efficient way to get that done? Well, I think as a board, you, you're making clear your priorities uh, to me, and that's uh, heard loud and clear. Um, I've already had conversations with our building principals about the expectations for being outside, uh, and um, our principals are working through those expectations to communicate them with teachers. So uh, I am uh, confident we'll be able to follow through with the board's expectation around outside time, either way. 
that satisfactory? Oh, sorry, Ms. Beam. So I actually really liked the idea that was proposed tonight of adding someone to kind of help teachers who maybe this doesn't come as naturally to. I think that we've had other initiatives. Setting up outside classrooms. For outside time, okay. for, for helping to, to train them on ideas for spending time outside to help prepare some curriculum and help adapt it to be outside, to make sure we have the right supplies in line, to, to maybe even get donations as we need to. I think that whether it be a volunteer or a paid physician, it's something that would be super helpful because it's one more thing we're asking teachers to do, right? And we already asked an awful lot of our teachers. And so anything that aids them in an ask, I think is appropriate. So if we don't already have that kind of resource in our district, I would like us to look into finding a resource, whether it be paid or volunteer. Anyone else? I would generally agree. And I think that um, finding um, uh, PD money for these kind of things uh, using our resources in town. Uh, we all know Miss Ellen quite well and know that she would be a good resource for this kind of leadership. Um, so finding a way to get outside more is always something that uh, I would encourage. And, and I think it is worth noting that the PTA did uh, yeoman's work with this last year with fundraisers to get us tents. And, and while we don't want to rely on them and push for them, I do think that that is an area where uh, if they were looking to help and if there were people involved with the PTA listening and watching tonight, I think that that is an area that... Um, guidance, assistance, supplies, whatever it might be, um, would be something that's appreciated by the schools, but also certainly um, conducive to that increased outdoor time as much as we can, um, you know, when the weather permits uh, throughout the year. Um, I just kind of want to add, you know, I agree with everybody, you know, very strongly encouraging the use of much more outdoor time than we have, um, even more than we did last year uh, is really important. And with the notes about weather permitting and things like that, okay, maybe not when we have a hurricane rolling through, but um, even with you know some rain and things like that, we have tents, that's why they're covered. <laughs> um, so I think that there is possibility to spend time outside um, in the rain, underneath those tents, doing some instruction and things like that. And I think we should strongly encourage it. I, I think that, um, we need to be careful, you know, it's, we're not running, asking kids to run around outside in the pouring rain, but at the same time, um, in the time it takes to get from the classroom to the tent, our kids might not necessarily melt. So I think that sometimes we're a little cautious about weather. Um, and I think maybe we should encourage it more than we do now. So. Victoria, you had your hand raised. Yep. Just one more thought here on it. Um, I think that we have heard and many of us know about the importance of vitamin D getting the kids outside is important for that reason. It's also important because in our plan uh, that the reopening task force gave to us, um, they do talk about the fact that they can be unmasked outside. So if masks are ever needed um, in any color, this will allow for additional time for the students to be unmasked outside, which I think is important. Um, and my only, my only hesitation on this is that I would like to ask our superintendent to come back to us with actual information and data after let's say the first month so that we know how this is, has worked. I think that consistency across classrooms, across grade levels is very important. Um, and I would just hope that we have, have some actual information about that. you happy to okay. thank you your, your pause had me concerned that you were concerned about that so well I, I we don't have a mechanism to track how many times a teacher goes outside so it's going to be difficult to provide the board information on uh, without creating a sense of accountability from our teachers when we're trying to encourage them to try something new and different so uh, happy to report back happy to report what we have uh, done to support our teachers in the use of outside time um, happy to, to provide as much information as I possibly can. Thank you. Does anybody else have thoughts they would like to share about the reopening plan, either um, some of the additional details that aren't specifically laid out in the plan or some of the items that are? Yes. Um. Wow, I got a whole microphone. I got two microphones myself. <laughs> I really don't need that much. 
And um, yet you're not speaking to anything that I No, I'm just double checking my notes to see if there's anything else other than this. All right. So we've heard a lot of information um, from everybody between Thursday and today. Um, we have gotten countless emails. There is way more feedback we've gotten through emails than we've gotten here tonight or we got on Thursday. Um, they will be in the minutes, but uh, it is not necessarily reflected um, in who shows up when um, in person. We also decided after Thursday's meeting, we needed to hear directly from parents. We've got over, over a thousand responses from Clark Wilkins and AMS families. Off the top of my head, we have 1,400 students between the two buildings, and we heard back from a thousand of them. Every parent was allowed to vote once for each child, and that was it. So that's a significant amount of feedback. And with that feedback, we heard that 57% of our families want to open with masks being required for staff and students. That's significant. That's not 51% of 200 people. That's not 57% of 200 people. That was a significant amount of feedback that I can't ignore. Um, given that and everything else that we've heard, as well as recommendations from the um, American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, local doctors, including um, the doctors over at CHAD, as well as local doctors in our community as, and surrounding communities, I'm gonna recommend that in yellow, that yellow status be changed, that masks will be required for everyone in the building when we are in yellow status. Is, uh, is this an, a motion? Is this a talking point? That, that is an official? Sorry, that was a motion. Okay. <laughs> I didn't Thank say you. I motion. Nope, so it is an amendment to make mask mandatory in the building. This would revert back to the plan that we uh, originally voted on uh, and modified on Thursday night at the SAU wide meeting. Um, it would not change the metrics, correct? It would just change the status. So using the same metrics we have now, the same scale of metrics between cases per 100,000, cases in town, uh, positive testing level, and then one other item that off the top of my head, I'm drawing a blank on, but using that same metric scale, um, to change the masking status. Do I have a second on said motion? I'll second. Okay. Uh, I will open it with discussion and, and I will um, steal the microphone here. Um, this is the, the part that I'm, I'm very proud that tonight, um, you know, I think we can say that this, this meeting has gone, it's the, the tenor of this meeting has been much more toned down. I think we got a lot of, um, a lot of our frustrations out on Thursday night. I know for a fact that the frustration level has not gone down, um, but the um, the tenor, it's much cooler in here tonight than it was uh, back on Thursday night. So for that, it, it fits into nicely what I wanted to speak about because this is very emotionally charged. We, we say that it's political, but it's really just emotions uh, that we're doing with this. We talk about kids in hospitals and Hospital ERs are, are flooded with kids and hospitals are flooded with kids. We're not hearing that these are all kids with COVID. These are kids in hospitals and it's, it's very misleading. And, and it's because it's with children that we hear about this from the media that we all understandably, we get puckered up and we get tight because nobody wants to think that a kid could die or a kid could get sick. But when we look at the numbers, it's just not happening with this disease. I mean, we, we can recap 38 million cases in the United States in the last 18 months, 1.6% death rate. It's 626,000 people. The vast majority of those, and, and I'm not belittling death by any means, um, it's folks that are senior citizens that are older, um, and many of them have had infirmary and in, yeah, infirmary, uh, comorbidities, excuse me. Um, they've not been healthy. Um, so that's a deeper discussion. Here in New Hampshire, we've been incredibly lucky. We're not a dense state. Our densest areas have seen uh, more trouble, but here in Amherst, we've, we've been fortunate. We have 18 active cases right now as a state, 1,500 deaths, which is only 1.3% of the entire case rate of, of, uh, of 105,000. So better than the national rate, but it's the impact on the kids that we never hear about. We hear cases, 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 cases. Um, Nobody talks about the 12 million cases of flu that kids had back in the 2018-2019 flu season or 2019-2020.
when over almost 600 kids died of the flu that year. Nobody talks about 4 million cases of confirmed COVID for kids this year, let alone what the CDC thinks is really probably more like 26 million cases for kids, 361 deaths for kids zero to 17. It's a 99.991 survival rate. If you give me those odds on anything, I will take them as fast as you can offer them to me. Here in New Hampshire, we have not had a single person under the age of 19 die from this disease. We've been incredibly lucky that it spared kids. We've had one person under the age of 30 and only eight people under the age of 40, um, which unfortunately is just now, I've gone just beyond that age bracket. Um, and for hospitalizations with kids, we've had just 15, less than 1% of kids under the age of 17 have actually been in the hospital. The state website has all of these numbers. The CDC website has them all. None of them give you any more insight into terms of how long they've been in the hospital. Were they hospitalized for it? Were they, did they go there for a broken leg? And did they have COVID when they tested because that's the hospital policy. Kids make up less than one hundredth of 1% of all deaths in the United States. And then for our age bracket, the five to 11 age group, which gets most of the middle school and it gets all the kids that can't be vaccinated at this point, just 97 deaths in 1.3 million cases, which is 99.993% survival rate. So I mentioned the other diseases. Flu has killed almost 200 kids in the last 18 months when we didn't have a flu season. We have had 800 kids, more than that number, almost 900 have died of pneumonia in that time. We have never done anything to try to stamp out those diseases. We say, my kids will get a flu shot. They don't get a flu shot. They'll get sick. They'll go home. They'll be done. They're just as likely to spread the flu to grandma and grandpa when they go see them. And that was the emotional plea that was made in the media by doctors like Anthony Fauci. It's not something that we can live our lives by. We can't do that every single day. I am not against masks. I have no problem with masks. In, in full disclosure, my wife would probably have our kids wear a mask when they go to school right now. It's a battle you can fight with her. I will choose not to. I prefer to sleep in my house. But that's not, that's not the point. The point is we have the choice to do that. We went to Florida. We wore our masks in Florida a week ago because we were inside and because the cases were tremendously higher than what they are now. But it's still a choice that we made. And we made that choice because we know that this is not going away. Anthony Fauci said this eight weeks ago. This is a disease that's not going away. He mentions we've only killed one disease off, and that was smallpox, and that was because of vaccines. So the vaccines that we have, we're incredibly lucky that they've been as successful as they, as they have been, and even still as successful as they are this far into the pandemic when they're waning with the Delta variant. So I, I will close with, if we want to have people wear masks, you can wear an N95. There was a study that came out yesterday 50% better, or it, it, about five times better blocking um, aerosols than just cloth masks are at this point with an N95. And I understand N95s are uncomfortable, but if you can't put your own kid in an N95 or don't want to make that decision, I don't feel that it's our right to say it's not fair for that one kid to wear an N95. Everybody needs to wear a cloth mask. If it's worn properly, might have a minimal effect on this disease. The numbers do not back it up. And I feel that we've never done this taking away parents' choice for something that is statistically unproven. So with that, I will, I've said my piece and I will turn it over. Can I follow up, Tom? Oh, yes, please. Okay. Um, I believe that as much consistency as we choose to, or as we are able um, amongst the SAU is very important. At our last meeting, we changed some of the metrics that are in the, um, the factors table. I'm sure everyone who's watching at home or who's here in the audience has seen this, uh, this chart that shows us the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, and the blue. This whole plan was developed by our superintendent um, after working throughout the summer with a reopening task force. Um, that reopening task force includes our local nurses, our school nurses. We talk a lot about how it's very important to make sure that we're focusing our reaction based on what's happening within our schools. At our last SAU meeting, we changed our percentages um, greatly along the school cases line. So our yellow had been one to 3% of school cases. Now it's two to 8%. Our orange had been three to 8%. Now it's eight to 10%. Later on in our um, reopening task force document, orange did require that masks would be used indoors for all staff and students. That really shows us that three to 8% was the old threshold. 
and now two to 8% is now yellow. So it had been an orange with that percentage and now it is called yellow based on the change that happened at the SAU meeting. Um, I just think that that's an important point to note because until I had really stopped and looked at those changes and looked at and really aligned it with the different protocols that were figured out by the reopening task force and superintendent steel, um, I did not realize that. Just food for thought. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. I would say don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Right now, we know that we have recommendations from respected organizations that we use for many other things. We look to others to be experts to tell us how many kids should be in the class reasonably, what our class sizes should be. We look to experts to tell us many things, including on this board, we all of us know that we are not educational experts and we are not health policy experts. So we look to the experts and I think that their guidance on this is very clear. I think that for us to ignore guidance from, if we will listen to them for other things, why would we not listen to them for this? We can't pick and choose when we listen. I think that's irresponsible. And I think that it is, since I am not admittedly an expert, I do look to them, but I can tell you what I also do besides blindly listening. I do, I know that I'm, sometimes when I speak, I can be a little bit emotional. I, I feel strongly about my role but my role as a board member is very different than my role as a parent. So I will give examples from my family because it is not my place and I don't have, it's not ethical for me to give examples from other people without their permission. And so to make things more understandable, I will give personal examples. But I can tell you that I personally, as a role member, as a board member, I know that the decisions I make affect everyone under my purview, all of the students and all of the staff. And so when I look at anything, not just this, not just this issue, I do personal research. I speak directly to and hear from families and voters in Amherst and Mount Vernon. I consult with the SAU administration and staff. I review information, guidance, and research from respected experts in the field. We benchmark best practices in other districts, both within New Hampshire and without. That's why we just changed the lunch recommendation because we looked at other districts and we looked at what they were doing and said, that seems like a great idea, let's do that. We have discussions as board members, both during meetings and in our committees. And I traditionally ask a whole lot of questions. So I do not blindly follow ever. And so while I will never be described as dispassionate, I can tell you that this is not based on emotion, this is based on logic and on the recommendations we have at hand. And so while we have been very lucky in New Hampshire and we've had good mitigation, we've had a lot of people following guidelines, we've had a lot of people getting vaccinated and we've been very lucky that our numbers have been low. We don't live in a magic bubble and we need to do everything we can to be proactive rather than being reactive. And the proactive thing that we can do right now and the best guidance that we have been given by respected organizations that we turn to for, again, many other things, is that we have everyone who cannot be vaccinated because we've taken away that level of mitigation. So 12 and under cannot be vaccinated whether they want to be or not. With our older kids, it's maybe a different conversation, but with our younger ones, they can't be. We've taken that, that is not an option. So the next best option is to have everyone in the building masked, to have good hygiene, to still spread out as much as we can, to be outside as much as we can. And I am thrilled that we get to be outside without a mask. That was one thing last year that I thought was very difficult. We, we helped one day where we had to uh, be on, on playground duty and it killed me to say, put your mask back on outside because it felt unnatural and wrong. They get an opportunity to see faces. And I am so grateful that we had a teacher come tonight and say, that you have ways to still tell very easily, not maybe not as easily, but you have ways to tell if someone's struggling. If everyone else in class has started an assignment that was three steps long and you've got one kid and wondering where to start, you go and you help that child who's not doing anything yet because you know they need that little nudge. If you see a furrow in their brow, have you? if you have a child in your home, I promise, you know when they come through the door before you see their mouth or not, whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood. There are lots of ways and we have looked at studies. And so I am not 
a scientist and I am not a public health expert, but I again have done my research and I have talked to a lot of people who know far more than I do about these topics. They recommend this and they say that speech and, and clues of the whole body clue, we ask for our kids to do whole body listening. Well, we can also do whole body interacting with our children and they actually do better in being able to make eye contact when masks are being used they do better in being able to read whole body cues. So we are not so much taking away from them as giving them a new skill. So it is my recommendation that we follow the best guidance that we have available to us and that we open with everyone in the building masked. What else? I will, I don't know that I can add a lot to what the public or what my fellow board members have said, but I'll use, given the rain, I'll use a seafaring metaphor tonight. Um, we relied last year on um, our captain and our crew to navigate us through this storm. And um, I think they did a really good job. They asked for a plan um, from us, and I believe we should give them that pl plan, not rip out one of the sails and tell them to make do. Um, I trust them more than anyone else. And I trust that they ultimately want to get us to green. And I see multiple pathways to green. And I trust them to navigate these seas for another year and get us there. Um, and so that's who I want to rely upon. Um, go ahead, Tom. No, no, I, sorry. I, my, we don't have a pathway to green. There is nothing that we can do that gets us to green that has been proven unless we can vaccinate the heck out of kids at this point, but we're probably six months away from that. That is the only way we're going to get to green. We have no control over that. So for us to continue to put masks on and, and hope and, and pray that we get there, again, it's, it's emotion speaking. I, I don't know why we can't expect that parents can make the best decisions for their kids. Number one, meaning that if your kid is sick, your kid has a cough, a sneeze, a cold, we had to do it many times this summer, uh, probably three or four weeks in a row, at least one day where one of our daughters was sick, couldn't send her to school, even though we knew it was a negative, we were going to get a negative test. She was around the other kids that got sick. I had to do it at one point, And that drove me nuts. We can trust our parents to keep their kids home. I think they did a pretty good job of that last year. And, and if, if it wasn't the case, um, you know, I have not been told otherwise. The other thing is, I don't know why we can't expect people to take their own protection into their own hands. We can't say, everybody's got to wear these masks that, that might or might not work. And, and if they're not on correctly, if you have a KN95, that is going to provide protection for you. It's not just a mask that allows you to not spread to somebody else. It's a very perverse way of thinking that your entire job is to protect other people. Why do we not rely on people to wear their own masks and wear them a KN95 because somebody else might say something to them or, or they might be the only kid in class. I wanted Nikes as a kid. My dad bought me roofs. And I remember that in first grade, it was embarrassing. Now I look at them and they had a cool zipper on the tongue for coins, but um, I wish I had those sneakers, but that's just not the way the world works. Everybody parents differently. If, if my parents say you're gonna wear a mask, you know, tough cookies, you're gonna have to wear a mask. I don't know why we're taking that away from parents to give them that choice, knowing that 57% want a mask mandate, but more than that are going to comply by it. So I don't know why we feel we have to mandate that. That's my, my big thing with this is that the numbers show that people will take those decisions and, and do what they think is right. And I think it's pretty obvious we'll have a lot of people that will do what they think is right. And, and that's what matters. Victoria, you had your hand raised before. I'm going to rescind it. Rescind? Okay. I'm rescinding my hand. <laughs> my hand raised. <laughs> so is there any further discussion? Yeah, I, okay, I'm sorry, Terry. I didn't see your hand. Um, I would like to respond to your point. I would like to believe that everybody has everybody else's best interest in heart. I have to tell you that's not been my experience in life. I, I try to be a pretty positive person and I try to see the best in people, but I am not um, I am not blind to the less positive aspects of people. And when it comes down to it. When you have to get to work, you're going to put Tylenol on your kid and send them to school, whether they had a fever when they woke up or not. Not everyone, but a lot. And then if you ask the nurses, there are a lot of magical, oh my goodness, they woke up fine. And by lunchtime, their fever is there. Where did that come from? You are most transmittable two days before you have any symptoms. So to say we are going to check you for fever, that's nice. That's good. If you are actively showing symptoms, it might catch that guess what? You may be asymptomatic, which is one of the things that is most frightening about. And again, I don't like to use the word 
fear or frightened. That is one of the most problematic things about dealing with this particular illness is that you can be asymptomatic and going on about your merry way and you think you're fine and you are spreading to other people. And so I think that the only way to truly treat everyone is you have to assume that they could be transmittable when they have no idea. And so not through any fault of their own, they may put on a mask if they thought they were symptomatic, but they can spread when they don't know that they are spreading. And we are all breathing the same air. And we know we are gonna have a meeting on Wednesday where we talk about our facilities and we can try to open windows more. We can try to ventilate, but we know that these facilities were not built with the thought that fresh air exchange was a very important concept. And it is now, we know the quality of the air matters greatly in being in an educational environment. And when we design anything new, it will be designed with that in mind. These buildings were not designed with that in mind. So they are substandard for that particular purpose right now at best. And so now anything that I can limit putting into the air and having it circulating around, I will go for whatever limit I can get because it is the best that we can do and do not again, let the perfect be the enemy of the good and this is the best that we have. So no, your choices do affect others. And I really liked the example of smoking because you know what, if I go and I help somebody and they've been smoking, I come home smelling like it, whether I ever, I've never smoked anything in my life. But if I go around it, I certainly come home smelling like it. And if I'm in a room where it's been happening, it's now exposed me to secondhand smoke and the effects of that, whether I want it or not. And that is not something that I'm willing to do to our students and our staff. But, but to get to, to further this point is we have, we, we all have choices to make on this and, you know, we don't take away, we don't allow people not to drink and drive because they're going to share the road with somebody else. We, we have to have limits on this, but we can't, if somebody's in their house, we can't do anything about that. So we're, we're not all, it's, I have a hard time taking choices away from people as a, I don't want to say punishment, it's not the right word, because we can't trust them to make the right decisions. We have other metrics in this plan that allow us where if all of a sudden we start to see parents coming in with their, their kids are coming in with flu uh, and it's repeated or they're coming in Tylenol up and then by the end of the day they have a fever, we have metrics where we can say at this point, you know what, we need to go to orange because we have a lot of cases of, of something in the schools. Being the not looking for the perfect or passing up the good to, for the perfect is what we're doing if we change this yellow. We have orange. We have that fallback, whether it's a last-ditch effort to keep schools open, God forbid something happens where this thing gets out of control, or if it's because we don't like the way that things are going in our class for whatever reason. We have a lot of cases in Amherst. We have a lot of kids that aren't, um, you know, either they're coming in and taking off their masks. We have other mechanisms to fall back on, to go right to this step, which is our only um, freedom and freedom is not the right word, but it's our only choice that parents have. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, I don't know what it's going to do. If we have cases, all of a sudden, well, what do we do now? Then we have to close the schools. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense that you're going to take this away from people when you have the enemy of the good is the perfect. Do you have something that you can fall back on with that orange status? And, and we were giving superintendent Steele the flexibility to go into that if needed um, based off those metrics. It's not, you know, you have to add them all up and this is exactly where you are. There's nuance in there. If needed, we can move to something else. Yes, Beth. So my issue with leaving orange as the only masked status, one of them, is looking at the mitigation strategies within the orange status. It's what we were this past year. It's one-way hallways. It's it's that rigid, you know, kids can't be facing each other in the classroom. It's what, you know, the rows of desks that we grew up with that are boring and feel like a lecture hall. Whereas within the yellow status, it puts our kids in masks, but allows for the ability to have them be kids. It's that step in between green and rigidity that allows them to wear masks, but still be able to you know, sit in groups, do group work, work together and have that closer contact than they were allowed to have last year. Going from mask free to absolute rigidity doesn't really control and it, it just, it doesn't, 
yeah, it's reactive and it doesn't prevent anything. It's just dealing with it after the fact, once the cat's already out of the bag. Um, so that's why I have a hard time having only one option with that. You also mentioned several times that, and many people have, about the death rate with children, death rate in New Hampshire. However, you know, and you hinted at it slightly, but kids are still getting hospitalized. Even if they might not be dying, kids are getting hospitalized. Nobody should have to watch their child sit in a hospital if there's something that we as a district could do to prevent that. What do we have as an answer when somebody's child ends up in the hospital and they turn around and say, you, did, you didn't go, you went against the CDC, you went against your own nurses, local medical professionals, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Yeah, okay, fine. We might not have a lawsuit, but you know what? That's not okay. When we had something that we could do, right now our kids don't have the option of, as a, of a vaccine. They don't. They're too young for it. So he and I totally understand why they made the choice that they did. Mount Vernon, I understand why they made the choice that they did. They have zero cases in their town and have for a really long time. Uh, we had almost no cases right along with Mount Vernon. However, now we're above Milford. We have more cases than Milford does. We, our cases started to go up significantly over the last two weeks. So 18 cases isn't huge, but given the fact that it's summer, everybody's outside, this is very different in a very different place. We're starting school in a very different place than where we were last year with case counts. Opening up that way with, our, with zero options for our kids to have any sort of real mitigation other than hand washing doesn't feel right. I'd like to call the vote if there's no no one else is ready to speak. Well, I, I'm ready. I just said, I thought you were going to um, speak okay. something. So I, 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 I'm comfortable calling a vote in a minute, but two things. Number one, again, I, I said this on Thursday, we're going to allow vaccines to be the indicator of when we can open up for everybody just to go hog wild with what they want. What if I want to get my kid a vaccine? That is my choice. And if my kid gets sick, again, statistically, 0.0068% of kids they got, that's the percentage of fatality rate that they, they cover. 29 kids have been hospitalized. Less than 1% of all the cases in the state, all the kids' cases have resulted in a hospital visit without any nuance as to why they were there. So if the vaccines are going to be my choice and then I'm um, SOL if my kid gets sick, I don't understand how something with less science behind it and much more um, where everybody has to do it or, or nobody does it or else it doesn't work. I don't understand why that's what we're going to rely on. If I get my vaccine... The minute they told me I could take my mask off, I was in Trader Joe's walking around proud as a peacock without that stupid thing on. And I haven't worn it since then other than at the airport. But that is my choice. And they said that kids, you know, if you weren't vaccinated, you had to wear them. I saw a million kids this summer that were clearly not vaccinated, not wearing their masks. But that is those parents' choice because I have my protection. I go back to, again, an N95. If you want to mask your kid up, don't send them in with cloth. Get an N95. You have to change it every day, but we should be changing cloth masks four or five, six times a day. I know when I fly and, and came off the airplane, my mask was nasty because it was wearing it for three or four hours in the airport. That's not helping anybody. It's not helping me. I take it off. It's certainly not helping anybody that, that may or may not be near me. I don't understand why that is the metric that we're going to say is you have a choice, but you don't have a choice in something that's much more nebulous. And if we're at the same point as where we were last year, why wouldn't we start with the same mitigation? Why would we get tighter mitigation? Why would we want to tighten things up and then have a fallback from there? If we're at the same number of cases or at the same point last year in terms of our mitigation, we shouldn't be because we are way less statistically in cases. We have a third of the cases in the state as our peak at what we saw in January of last year. We never changed statuses. We had the mask. We did all this other stuff. I think we need a place to grow where we can be mask free for a little while. And if we have to grow into it, we can do that. I just don't think that it warrants it right now to take away that choice from, from parents. Anybody else? Sorry. So a couple of things. I know that on the one hand, we're saying that we're trying to make this as a very, a very logical fact-based thing, but then you want the feel good for parents to feel like they've got choice. Um, it's not I, a feel good. It's a, it's a liberty. It's their kids. Like, how are we to say this is what your kids have to do? Um, 
You know what? We have a dress code. A dress code is entirely different. I'm saying you don't get to come however you want. You, we have rules. We have things that affect others. We have got to think about, we, if somebody in your class has a peanut allergy and you're a peanut-free room, as a parent, you may say, well, my kid has been eating peanut butter sandwich every day since they were two. And that's a pain in the butt. I'm not, I'm sending peanut butter. It's not my kid that's allergic. And guess what? They don't get that option. They get the option to respect that that room is peanut free or that section of the cafeteria is peanut free. We don't say, hey kid, you can go eat in the janitor's closet because you can't be near peanuts. We make allowances all the time that protect the least among us. And so it is, it does not track for me that we say just because they might not die, but they could be very sick. We have a Delta variant that we didn't have last year. Our, what we have to deal with are different. It is far more contagious. It passes much more quickly. By the time we know we have a problem, it's probably going to be too late. And then our main goal is to have everybody, all of our learners there that we possibly can physically with us in school. That is the goal. And if that is the goal, anything that accomplishes that goal to me seems worth doing so long. And so we are taking away some of the things that were very difficult and that made it a lessened experience. It made it a lessened experience to not be able to interact in a somewhat natural way. It made it a lessened experience to have to worry about the stress of, oh no, did I follow this rule? Did I follow that rule? To have one major rule is not so much to keep track of. It actually makes it simpler and it makes it less stressful. And it makes it less stressful for the kids who say, are you, are you not? And there is already an, a clause. If you have a medical reason that you can't and you go to your pediatrician and you get a note, you have the ability to say, for my child, this is not an option. We have always had that option. We will continue to have that option. I absolutely supported moving the numbers up. I absolutely supported extending our support to anybody who chooses VLAX. I am for making reasonable changes, but I am also for respecting our reopening committee and their work that they have done and their recommendations that they have made. And I am for respecting what the majority of our parents have asked of us and for following the science and the best that we have available to us at this time. Now, if things change and we get different guidance, then we will revisit the issue, obviously. But the guidance at this time is not, if you feel like it, it's not, if you think you'll be okay, there is, I've been doing a lot of, a lot of training recently on a lot of mental health issues. And one of the, the most heartbreaking things is that someone who finds a medication that works well for them and deals with a mental health issue with, in concert with that medication, a lot of times they'll say, I'm better now, I don't need to take this. So they stop taking it. And then of course, a lot of their original symptoms come back and then they, they go right back to where they started. And it's a really preventable thing, but it's a, it's a thing that you feel that, you know, I'm doing fine right now. So we're doing good right now. Our numbers are low, but one of the reasons our numbers are low is because again, people have been outside most of the time. It is the middle of summer. And even in the summer, our numbers are higher than they were this time last year. And so to say that they're not going to go up and to expect that that won't happen and that again, we're in some magic bubble, I don't believe it. And I don't think it's the way to plan. I'd like to call the vote. That was my thought exactly. So we will, uh, we already passed the one amendment to add the line about the lunches in there. So this is on the overall plan, or excuse me, this is on the second amendment to change yellow status to masks mandatory. So we will have two statuses at mass mandatory, correct? That was the motion we were discussing. Okay, all in favor? Hold on. Oh, one, sorry. One clarification. Yes. Would be masks are required for all staff and students indoors? That was the motion, yes. Started. Okay. Yep. So we will call the vote. All in favor? Four. All against? One. Motion passes four to one. And so now with that, we will vote on the entire plan as a whole uh, with the two amendments regarding lunch and regarding masks and yellow status. Uh, 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 yeah, try this again. We're back to our original amendment to actually uh, to accept the plan with these amendments to, to go in line with the SAU overall plan that can send this on to Superintendent Steele. We have a vote for that. Try that again. <laughs> Hold on, bear with me. So we have a new reopening plan 
So I guess we just scrap our first Pretty our much. first motion. Yeah. So we'll we we'll make a the first motion is on the table. You have two amendments. You pass the two amendments. Now you're back to the original motion. Yes. So do we need to create a new motion? Okay. So I was wait. correct. So is the new motion? So wait, because the motion was on the table, we're now voting on the amended you plan. We're yes, you vote, yes. As amended twice. Correct. Oh, as amended twice. Wait, Thank you. you. It's a, it's it's the same motion, but it's the plan as amended twice tonight with the two mentions. We mentioned the lunch line and then the yellow masks required for all staff and students inside the building. So I will take a vote on that. All in favor. And all against. Four to one. That one passes as well. Superintendent Steele, you are, have a reopening plan from the Amherst. We're first, actually, aren't we? Everybody else still has to approve. So we have a reopening plan as approved by this board um, and the SAU. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. A motion. A second. All in favor? Unanimous, five to nothing. We are done for the night. Everybody drive home safely. Uh, it does look like that hurricane finally came to us. Stay safe, and uh, we will appreciate your giving your feedback at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you.